Okay. Good evening, everyone. It is 6 p.m., so we'll start on time to ensure that our live stream viewers are uh, not disappointed. This is the third and final installment of our uh, referendum presentation roadshow, and I'm going to make my best attempt at ensuring I'm as thorough as possible. But by this point in the, uh, in the circumstance, I, I want to ensure also that uh, I get the right information out, but sometimes it feels like I've been repeating myself. So I'm going to continue to remind myself that uh, there's a number of people that may not have heard the information I'm going to share. By the way, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end. Additionally, I'll mention at the end as well, I'll show you my information, but my uh, contact information is on the school district website, wrps.org where you can find my email. I am Craig Brorn, the superintendent. And my cell, uh, telephone number, pardon me, is 715-424-6701. And once again, I will uh, talk about that here at the end of the program. So we'll get started. First off, a question that uh, is potentially out there is around this baseball softball quadplex project. And one of the reasons that we're talking about it here as part of the referendum presentation is to tell you that those projects, these projects, pardon me, are not associated with one another. The baseball softball quadplex project is um, uh, basically a community driven, community led event uh, uh, project, pardon me, and it is uh, done in collaboration with some uh, community groups interested in baseball softball. And the proposal is of course to have that quadplex on the Lincoln High School property. The entirety of that, uh, with the exception of a small portion that uh, may be the district's responsibility, is being funded via, uh, in, in large part, a $5.6 million grant from the Legacy Foundation, in addition to uh, naming rights and marketing opportunities. And the, uh, it certainly looks like this is going to uh, transpire, and so we'll be seeing uh, sometime this spring work, in, work beginning on this baseball softball quadplex. But I emphasize again, it's an exciting project, it's a great project for the, uh, the school and the community, but it is not associated at all with the, either referendum question. And that was the primary reason to bring it up here and point out that it's another cool amenity that uh, should be on the horizon relatively soon here in Wisconsin Rapids. Uh, this is just a uh, rendering of what uh, that, that quadplex will look like in a general sense. And there's one other picture too as you're entering. So, getting into the point of the matter regarding the April 6th referendum. Um, there are plans to have two questions on the ballot. Question one addresses operational needs. That uh, one I will refer to as a levy override question. Um, that is for $2 million a year for five years. And it is all incorporated into curriculum and technology. As I work through this uh, presentation, I'll go into some details around what specifically we mean by that and how we'll spend those dollars. Question two is a bond issue or a debt issue question, and that is asking taxpayers for, uh, to borrow $34 million for projects that include both safety and security and educational space improvements. We'll go through all of the specifics around that question as well as talk about what the potential or projected uh, impact to local property taxes are for the school portion of the local property taxes if both of these questions were to pass when April 6th rolls around. So once again, this is just a, a, a repeat. Question one is $2 million per year levy override or to exceed the uh, revenue limit. $2 million per year for five years beginning in the 21-22 school year and ending in the 25-26 school year. Question two is a question, a debt issue question or a capital uh, referendum question to borrow 34 million. We're constructing secure entrances at all schools, renovating Lincoln High School science uh, labs and adding a new library slash student center as well as an office area. We'll go through that in detail. Uh, construction of a gym out at Think Academy, which is Rudolph Elementary and then other capital maintenance and infrastructure improvements. And as I indicated, we'll walk through each and every aspect of that. So what specifically we're talking about uh, should be abundantly clear by the time we wrap up here tonight. Good point, to, good uh, spot to point out that the projected tax impact with regard to the approval of both of these questions, and I emphasize for your school portion of the taxes, is zero. And I'm going to get into some detail when we move uh, towards the end of the presentation about how that's possible or what that circumstance, uh, what's included in that circumstance, as well as run through a couple of scenarios for you that indicate 
uh, even uh, catastrophically speaking, what we might see. But I'll get into more detail with respect to that uh, as we move through uh, and towards the end of the presentation. One of the questions that we've heard from um, taxpayers and individuals that have contacted me or the district office is, why are you asking two questions and only two questions? Um, and under state statute, we have to separate a levy override question, that's the $2 million a year for five-year question, from a bond issue or debt issue question. So those always have to appear as two separate questions. Additionally, uh, not so long ago, uh, but now would be you know a few years back, you would see multiple debt issue questions or capital improvement questions on a ballot. So you would see question one, shall the district borrow $13 million to do the secure entrances, yes or no? Shall the, shall the district borrow uh, $19 million to renovate Lincoln High School as described, yes or no? Shall the district, and it would go through and enumerate all of those portions, because the question was from taxpayers, why are you rolling that all together in one $34 million bond issue question, why not breaking it apart? And the answer to that is, we can't. So the maximum number of questions we can ask now under statute is two. One being the levy override and one being the debt issue uh, or the, the capital referendum. Is it a possibility that if the capital or debt issue referendum does not pass that we might rework that and come to voters with a, a different number and different question to address secured entrances as an example at a different uh, point in time? The answer to that question is uh, potentially but that conversation would be had at the board level depending upon the outcome of the referendum. So getting into the nuts and bolts around question one, once again, this is an operational referendum, also called a levy override, $2 million a year for five years. Um, and the whole point is to update curriculum and expand access to uh, digital access, pardon me, to academic software, instructional kits, and what I'm incorporating, what we're, pardon me, incorporating into this is virtually everything. So it's similar to what you would remember from the past, textbooks, workbooks, and those sorts of consumables, but it also includes things like um, licenses for certain software, educational software, which is as it stands now in 2021, how um, many of our uh, curricular purchases are made. So there, in, in a lot of cases there is um, a hard component like a textbook or a work workbook and there's also a digital or online component that you pay for over the course of you know three years five years or, or seven years um, additionally incorporated into that and again we'll get into some details has to do with technology updates and purchases and that includes infrastructure so things like our Wi-Fi network um, our data centers in addition to uh, computers for kids so we currently operate a one-to-one -one program, meaning each kid at Rams and Lincoln get a computer. Uh, we'll go through the details of what that cost entails. Very clearly there's technology, uh, hardware and software that's relevant to uh, staff use as well. Um, so all of that, sum total, is kind of under the umbrella of curriculum and technology. And it's difficult in a lot of cases to tease those two things apart, right? In 2021, they are kind of uh, cohesive and, and, and placed together. Once again, we'll get into some of these details. So in a general sense, um, we've purchased, the, the district, pardon me, has spent between two hundred dollars to $400,000, pardon me, $540,000 per year on curriculum purchase over, purchases over the past several years. And that includes every content area and every grade level. And so when we're purchasing curriculum, we're purchasing on a cycle, and the cycle comes up based upon uh, district adopted uh, curriculum purchasing and usually aligns with a timeline of we've been at a seven, eight or 10 year sort of timeline. One of the questions is, well, why do you need to update that information? Well, clearly there is content areas that change over that time period. In addition, there are uh, subscriptions to online content and seats, as I mentioned, that only have a certain lifespan. We don't typically do like K-12 curriculum across the board and spend a great deal of money. It's kind of piecing it together over time so that over time you address each curricular area. Meaning we're not gonna purchase language arts curriculum for everybody in the district K-12. You might see elementary taken care of in one year. Uh, and then you might see the middle school in a different year and potentially the middle and high school in a different year or just the high school as an example. In some cases, you might see curriculum purchase where we're gonna do foreign language this year plus 
uh, technology education, and you might not see you know, other stuff in, in those years. So that's all dependent upon the dollars we have access to, the budget, where we're at in the cycle, and ensuring that we have the most up-to-date uh, curriculum as we possibly can, given those, given those factors. Additionally, I've mentioned these renewals around annual licensing, educational management software. That's about $320,000 per year. That is a number that, based on existing business models, as it were, for those that are selling products to the educational market, tends to grow over time. And it's not because your multi-year agreement is changing significantly each year. It's because that has become kind of the preferred interface. The idea that kids all have computers, both at school and at home. Staff clearly have computers. This pandemic has absolutely highlighted the need for technology uh, in both student hands and, and in staff hands. Uh, and that's, that's the uh, interface and that's the mechanism. Uh, so that includes things like printing, network, archiving, Canvas, which is an um, educational management platform that they use here at Lincoln High School, Seesaw, educational management platform that they use at the elementary school, Securely, which is a program that monitors and tracks um, what our students are doing with uh, district-issued email and, and internet use, so that it's, uh, of course, appropriate. And so total together, uh, we're looking at nearly, well, on the high end, $860,000 a year just in maintaining these annual licenses in addition to purchasing new uh, curriculum via our um, cycle. Then we get over into technology, and one of the pieces that uh, you'll indicate is that uh, there at the bottom you see the total fairly quickly to be 7.615 million. And one of the questions would be, you're asking for 10, but you're gonna spend seven and a half or the lion's share of that just on technology updates. And the answer to that question is, that's not 100% true because a levy override uh, or those $2 million that we would have access to each year can be used interchangeably or flexibly within our Fund 10 budget, our general fund, which means we have opportunities to spend dollars out of Fund 10 in a, in a way that we had anticipated and planned to purchase computers or some of this stuff over time. But we would not be able to do uh, these purchases in their entirety, as an example, if we didn't have access to the additional dollars via the levy override. So some of the things that we're talking about in, in this case and some uh, ballpark numbers attached to those are things like classroom audio and microphone systems. That's estimated about 400,000 district-wide. Replacing smart boards with interactive displays. That's estimated about $1.5 million district-wide. For those of you that aren't aware, a smart board uh, back in, let's say, uh, early 2000s-ish uh, is basically an interactive whiteboard. So there's a projector and then there's a whiteboard and it's touch sensitive and there's programs that you can run and use educational software on that smart board. Well, those have been in place long enough that that software is no longer supported. So you cannot, you really use it uh, to the extent that you could in the past because just like with some folks that have had a cell phone for perhaps a little longer than its usable life or a home computer, there's a point at which the companies that are providing software to that uh, computer or phone, or in this case, smart board, don't update it. And there's then no ability to use that in a reasonable fashion any longer. So then you gotta buy a new computer or get a different cell phone. Um, the, the interactive displays that they're being replaced with, would be replaced with, look more like a flat screen TV um, and it's mounted on the wall, but it of course is touch sensitive and interactive and does things uh, uh, very similarly to what you could do on a smart board, but it's the kind of the next iteration in technology for interactive uh, presentation systems in classrooms. Then we have um, the replacement of elementary student iPads. So that would be iPads that kids can use in the lower elementary grades, 4K through second. Uh, the estimated cost there is about $600,000 purchasing Chromebook cards for elementary students, the uh, third, upper elementary, third through fifth grade. The estimate there is 375,000. Um, Chromebooks are uh, basically an internet capable device. The primary uh, interface with a Chromebook is uh, the internet and it's uh, via Chrome, which is the uh, web navigator. That is what we issue to our students um, uh, to use in the classroom as well as what they can take home and use. Additionally, continuing the one-to-one -one program at Lincoln and Rams, I mentioned that earlier. So each kid that's in sixth grade at Rams gets a Chromebook issued to them, and each kid that's in ninth grade at Lincoln gets a Chromebook issued to them. 
and they keep that Chromebook for the duration of their time uh, at Rams and or Lincoln. And in fact, seniors, uh, when they graduate here at Lincoln, have an option to purchase the Chromebook that they've been issued uh, and have over the past four years if they would like. And if they don't like uh, to purchase, then it would get rotated back into the, into the um, pool. But the estimate there is about 105 to 225,000 per year. And that number is a range because it depends upon the purchasing cycle. At Lincoln, we are purchasing Chromebooks for the freshman class every year. And as I indicated, they keep them until they're a senior. Once you're to about five years, six for sure, a Chromebook is gonna, gonna get past its usable life. And that more has to do with the hardware and the, the machine kind of wearing out from use. But it also points to why we're talking about a range. Because at the middle school, you go from sixth grade, you get your Chromebook, you have it for seventh and eighth, and then you don't bring it with you to Lincoln High School, it gets reinvested back in, into RAMs, where some of them that are needing to be replaced are replaced but the entire uh, grade isn't purchased all in one fell swoop as it is at Lincoln High School. So some of those are recycled back in and we purchase just to kind of keep that class whole and to ensure every kid uh, has a computer. That's why there's a range. So in some cases we're purchasing say 350 or 400 and in other cases it might be closer to 800 where you're purchasing for two uh, full grade levels. Um, where was I at here? Oh, uh, also, of course, teacher workstations and laptops, because, of course, we issue technology to our teachers. The estimated cost there is uh, $385,000 district-wide. And then, as I mentioned, technology infrastructure is also included in that. That includes, like, data center updates. There's a data center here at Lincoln High School. There's also a, an off-site data center out in Rudolph. The estimate there is $175,000. That is information that we store, student information and district information that has to be stored and kept so that when kids and staff log in, their stuff is there. And it's housed uh, here at Lincoln in a data center and the backup is out offsite in, in Rudolph at uh, Think Academy. Um, updating network capabilities district-wide, the estimate there is 1.54 uh, million or 1.55 rounding up. Um, and those range from, and that's our Wi-Fi system, our Wi-Fi infrastructure. Those range from approximately 60,000 at River Cities High School, which is on the lower end of that spectrum, uh, smaller buildings, smaller number of kids, all the way up to the higher end, 320,000, which would be updating the Wi-Fi infrastructure here at Lincoln High School. One of the questions is why would you need to update Wi-Fi um, in the school buildings? And that really has to do with bandwidth and the interface that we see now on the internet. And for those of you that uh, spend a bit of time on the internet, you realize that most of the content now that we're seeing is video uh, and it's of course got audio associated with it. And that eats up um, a, a whole lot more bandwidth than it did back in the old days when you were just looking at uh, a, a static web page or scrolling through web content in that regard. So as I mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, if you were to total all those numbers up that I just uh, ran through, you're gonna come up with 7.615 million, which of course is a good portion of that 10 million if that levy override uh, question would pass. However, keep in mind that there are existing Fund 10 district expenditures that we would still continue to do uh, if these things, if this question didn't pass. And what we do then is just make choices, right? So we might not do some updates that the referendum would allow us to do. We're always typically going to defer on ensuring that our kids have access and the resources that they need. And then in a secondary fashion, we worry about um, staff. When we're talking about something like updating smart boards to interactive displays, that may not happen or it may happen in, in relatively small chunks over a longer period of time. So there is capability within our existing budget, <coughs> excuse me, to do some of this. Um, and I would also point out that the goal wouldn't be that we would do this all at once, right? So it would allow us to implement a plan in which replacement would take place over the course of several years. And I would argue those several years will likely extend past the life of the levy override referendum because again, it's for five years. And then after five, that authority um, is gone. The last operational referendum here in Wisconsin Rapids was in 2006. It was an uh, operational referendum for 1.14 million a year for five years. Um, and the, the district had uh, 
borrowed some of those dollars based on the promise of voters to, to cover that uh, via levy override for five years and invested those dollars and then would draw from that investment <clears throat> over time, allowing that investment or that, uh, those referendum dollars to be spent up until, ironically enough, just about last year when some of those dollars from that referendum back in 2006 were for the most part depleted. Um, that is a, an opportunity that presented itself to the district at the time based on uh, various investment scenarios. And it, it, it is possible that if this re levy override would pass, that we would engage in something similar. But that of course is dictated by market and whether or not uh, it would be an advantageous thing to engage in. In those days, you could generate um, uh, uh, increased revenue from the investment that was uh, greater than what you would owe in interest as it stands right now. That looks like it may be likely, uh, but I throw that out there just to say that it's a possibility and we would evaluate that based on uh, what the vote is, uh, you know, the, the vote count and whether or not the, the referendum passes. And since that time, since 2006, every other district, just about every other district in the state in, in Wisconsin, but also every district in the Valley Conference has passed an operational referendum. And why do we cite that? Is it because everybody else is doing it so we want to do it too? I highlight that or we cite that because uh, it's evidence of the fact that there is some issues with regard to the state funding formula and what that means in terms of access to new dollars. And in a general sense, there's been um, CPI or consumer price index increases cost of living increases, as it were, that trend anywhere from a percent and a half, give or take, can be a bit lower than that, up to say 3%. And much like uh, anybody that uh, has bills and, and is uh, living, uh, if you're living, you have bills, uh, those bills increase slowly over time and your expenses uh, increase. And I know what the response is, well, Social Security hasn't changed for years and there's other um, indicators that indicate that, you know, look, we don't have access to additional dollars either, but what I'll uh, show you towards the end here is how the uh, projections that we have uh, are indicating strongly that your taxes would not be impacted by the passage of this referendum in particular, and ultimately the passage of both of these. So <clears throat> getting on into the capital referendum or the bond issue, which would be question two. Once again, um, and we're gonna go through in detail what we're uh, discussing here by building as well as a cost estimate by building. But the estimate to do secured entrances on our facilities that house kids is $12,740,000. And in a general sense, what you see here on the display is what we mean by a secured entrance. So you go into the front door of the school, you're buzzed in, right? So you gotta ring the bell, you come up on a little screen, the secretary, whoever is monitoring that, rings a bell, the door buzzes and it lets you in you are automatically uh, fed into the office or forced to go into the office area. And then from there, you check in, uh, you provide your um, ID. If you're just there to drop something off, you drop it off and you're on your way. If you're there to go to a classroom or to do reading with kids or whatever the case is, you would provide your ID. If you haven't done so before, that gets scanned, you get a visitor badge, and then you're released to have access to the rest of the building. In some cases, the buildings are similarly set up to what you see on this uh, diagram. And in other cases, it's a little bit more uh, complex. And I'll get more into that as we work through the buildings. But that's one portion of the $34 million levy override, which is 12.7 roughly for the uh, implementation of secured entrances on the schools. Additionally, there's $21,260,000 $21 $260, that are incorporated into um, educational site, space improvements, and we'll get into these details as well. That includes what's depicted here, some modifications here at Lincoln, um, both to the second floor science classrooms as well as the front of the building with a new student resource center slash media center and office area that also adds the secured entrance. We'll get into that detail. It also includes the addition of a gym out at Think Academy or Rudolph Elementary, and we'll get into that detail as well. And here we go, what's happening at each school. So we'll start with the most complex. Um, pictured here is the first floor of Lincoln High School, so if you're in that front strip parking lot, you're basically, you'd be standing down here towards the front looking at it, looking at the front of the building, okay? 
and on all of these, anything that's depicted in the pink or red or salmon colored, whatever that uh, color looks to you, is considered an addition. And anything that's depicted in blue would be a renovation. And then anything that's depicted in that tan color would be considered a reassignment. So that's just moving stuff around here. Internally, there's really not uh, dollars and cents entailed in, in those portions. But shown here then in the, the salmon color is to the left of the entrance is the relocation of the office. Because as it stands now, without that here, the front entrance, if the, I don't know if you can see that online, but dead center of the screen basically it says lobby. That of course is not there. The front entrance is right where that uh, pinkish box ends and you go to the right near into the commons and you go kind of a little bit left and across a, a wide hall and that's how you get into the office. So this would be an example of a building that in order to implement a more secured entrance, you have to make some modifications to divert people to the office first. So that is why the office in this picture is located to the left of those entry doors. So all you're doing is bringing the existing entry doors out. People would enter uh, that door and immediately be funneled to your left. That's a new reception and office area, administrative offices, a conference room, uh, that sort of thing. And then to your right, what's depicted there is this updated media center uh, slash student resource center. And you can see incorporated into that um, are things like uh, private or, or small group work and study areas, elements that are very similar to a, a fairly standard library or media center that you see, but also on the right hand side, and kind of spilling into the commons, you see a much more flexible space that can be used for, again, collaborative groups, kids hanging out um, at lunchtime and at other times in the day, potentially a classroom, uh, a class that gets brought down to do various activities utilizing that space, as well as a, a computer lab area that's incorporated into that. So I like to kind of describe it as more of a college campus like student center sort of vibe, at least in that portion, much smaller scale, of course. The nice thing about that is based on its location, it spills into our existing commons, which is the open space that you see there with all of the white area directly above that. Um, and, and of course, that's where we're you know, having uh, lunch and, and uh, some presentations and so forth. So that is um, the first floor of Lincoln and it includes those additions, which also accomplishes getting that secured entrance on the front of Lincoln. Oh, I should also mention, if I go back, you can see that the majority of what you see up above that in tan is a reassignment. So those offices would be reassigned to, to different personnel. That's our existing office, uh, office space because it's across that hall. And then there's a couple of minor um, modifications or renovations depicted in blue there just to get those spaces ready for what their intended use will be if the referendum does pass and we make these modifications. And then you get into a little bit of the meat of the second floor. So depicted here is, again, anything in blue is considered a renovation and anything in, in that salmon color is an addition. What you're seeing here on the right-hand side of the screen in the salmon color is a relocation of some of our foreign language rooms. They're depicted as Spanish, and those would be new. Uh, they are part of that construction that we saw on the front of the building, right? And above what would be the resource uh, center, the media center, or student resource center. What's depicted in blue is a renovation of, of the existing second floor that exists kind of in the center of the floor. If you're familiar with the Lincoln High School layout, when you go upstairs, it's a giant rectangle with classrooms on both sides of that rectangle. So this is isolated for the most part to the center of that rectangle, which is where our existing science classrooms are. One of the topics of, uh, uh, of uh, questions that have come up is why would you address um, science classrooms? Well, I have not been around town for super long, but I've been around town long enough to know that the Lincoln that we're currently in, this is the pack of course, but Lincoln right next door is considered the new Lincoln and I recognize that it is new as compared to the old Lincoln, uh, but the new Lincoln was constructed in 1979, was finished in 1979. The science classrooms are both undersized and they're also in need of updates to get to 21st century standards. Infrastructure for science classrooms unfortunately is not uh, super cheap. And a lot of that cost is tied up in terms of the electrical uh, that's needed, gas that's needed, in addition to um, renovations or the, the uh, inclusion, pardon me, of the cabinets and countertops 
that you see, the black countertops, and of course, wood cabinets that you see in science classrooms. In my past experience, um, in my former district, we renovated a couple of science classrooms at uh, a middle school, so not even to the extent or level that we would propose for a high school. But on a conservative uh, basis, it costs about two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000 per classroom when you're talking about a science classroom. And as you can see here, we have multiple that are addressed. Um, it actually adds, it makes our science classrooms larger and adds one science classroom um, up there. The reason that the media center is relocated is because this left side of the screen where you see some blue spilling down uh, the way a little bit into white, that is the, the new science labs, if uh, constructed, would take up the space of the existing media center. So that's where we're buying space to increase the size of those science labs as well as add an additional um, science labs, science lab, pardon me, additional classroom. Now the question would be, uh, why do you need more space? Well, the, the thought process in 79 when the science labs were constructed was to have um, them be uh, built for 24 students. And uh, I do recognize that we've had um, similar numbers at Lincoln. I know we moved ninth grade here, but similar numbers at Lincoln in the past. And the science labs worked uh, to an extent. However, uh, there are safety concerns around having too many kids in, in a science lab in addition uh, to the fact that uh, 24 is a possibility, but we see typically 26, 28 on occasion, and so forth. And in making the modification, the modification would address or allow us the ability to have uh, 28 students. So instead of uh, 12 pairs of kids with your science lab partners, that would be up to, to 14 and providing some additional space to make that happen. In addition to, of course, adding a science classroom because there is a teacher that is using a space that is functional, but it's not technically a science classroom currently. So that is what's happening on the second floor of um, Lincoln High School. Moving on to some less complicated aspects of the bond issue, but still keeping in terms of the secured entrances, so we'll see uh, several slides in this regard, is an example of River Cities High School, and you can see the cost estimate is included on each of these um, slides. Uh, here at River Cities, it's a, it's a relatively minor modification and the estimate therefore is only around $85,000. Now, I don't mean to say only that that's not a lot of money, I just mean uh, proportionately speaking. So um, here you can see there's no additions planned, it's simply renovation and it's a relocation of where those uh, doors are as well as you know the addition of another um, entrance point into the office so that again you achieve that secured entrance. The person gets buzzed in, the only thing they have access to is that breezeway or lobby area and they're funneled directly into the office. At River Cities, that's fairly easily accomplished just by a few minor modifications. At Rams, Wisconsin Rapids Area Middle School, um, you see that it's somewhat similar in that it's once again more of a renovation of existing space. The price tag associated with that is 290,000. And then you get to an example like Grant, immediately you'll see the price tag of 1.27 million. That's very clearly different than a few hundred thousand. In addition, you'll see that there is that salmon or pink colored uh, depiction once again. And that is because at Grant, if you're familiar with that school, the office is actually, so that is um, where it's depicted is actually the front of the building, but the office is across that hall. Uh, and what you see kind of to the, to the left of the gym there, the upper left, that's where the office is. So there again, in order to accomplish that, the plan would be to add a new office space, which is depicted there in that pink or salmon color to the left, contiguous with the entrance. So once again, you're funneling your visitors to the office. It costs more dollars because you need to do an addition in order to make that happen in a reasonable fashion. When you don't have that, Grant is a perfect example, you can enter and you can go to your right and have access to the gym uh, area without too much of a problem. And you can head down to the left and be into where uh, classrooms are without too much of a problem unless of course you go directly to the office. Grove Elementary, another example of a fairly minor renovation. Um, 140,000 is the estimate there. That there too is a little rework of the front entrance as well as um, the addition of a, of a different door to get access to the office area or reception area. 
which is indicative of the blue for the renovation. Howe Elementary, here again, Howe Elementary's office is actually through the front door, down the hall a little ways to the left and then uh, across a bit. And because of that, there's an addition here depicted. The cost estimate is 1.38 million for that building. And that again is building a new office area, contigu contiguous, pardon me, with a secured entrance. Mead. Mead is a, um, a slightly different because if you look at the blue renovation, bottom portion of the screen, left-hand side, bottom portion, that is the, the entrance of the building and their office is contiguous with the entrance, so a renovation there is fairly minor to accomplish the secured entrance. However, you also see on the back side what's depicted there in, in uh, the, the darker blue, as well as the pink or salmon color to the left of that, would be an addition of an expansion of the cafeteria space at Mead. Um, the cafeteria space at Mead has been undersized, I would argue, probably for almost the life of the building. Uh, that's one of our larger elementary schools. There is uh, right around 400 students at Mead Elementary, and that space would allow us the opportunity to have uh, clearly more kids in uh, the lunchroom at any one given time, shrinking our lunch periods a little bit, getting more kids fed in a shorter period of time, uh, and ha allow for a better utilization of that space, um, also on the west side of town for other things that, uh, that might be going on. So there's an addition portion proposed at Mead as well as a, a renovation. Uh, which is simply an expansion of that cafeteria. Then we get to Think Academy. And I know that uh, one of the questions or uh, some of the commentary that we heard was around what is Think Academy? Um, Think Academy is actually Rudolph Elementary. It became Think Academy um, several years ago when the district had um, uh, developed uh, several different charter schools. And Think Academy is no longer a charter school, but at that time, they adopted the name Think Academy uh, and then went away from the Rudolph Elementary. Well, if you're in the Rudolph area, it's been long enough that Think Academy, everybody knows that that's Rudolph Elementary School. That school serves kids from Rudolph and Vesper area. It is not uh, you know, a unique or special school any longer. It's no longer a charter. It is a community-based elementary, just like all of our other elementaries and it houses right around 300 kids, and that is pretty close to the capacity for that building. Um, the, the addition of the gym, uh, or the proposal uh, of the addition of the gym, uh, is one portion, and then the other, another portion, depicted again in blue, is to add the secured entrance. And what you can see is the blue box that's to the top of the two is the existing office. The blue box to the bottom is what would be renovated to a new office. So it's kind of a flip-flop because there are offices associated with the entry. They're just not the uh, reception and, and office secretary area. Uh, they do other services out of there. So it's a little bit of a flip-flop as well as a rework as far as the entry is concerned to go with the uh, secured entrance there. And then of course the larger portion in the pink or salmon color is the addition of a new uh, gymnasium. The estimated cost there is 4.77 million. Existing currently uh, at Rudolph is a gym cafenatorium, and that's depicted there in white. And as you can see, that is nowhere near the size of a full-size gym. And I would argue this is a decent-sized gym, but it's also not, <coughs> excuse me, super <coughs> expansive. <coughs> excuse me. So. It'll give you an idea. We're talking about basically a basketball sized court with a little bit of space around some bleachers there on the left side and then some storage that's depicted there up on the top end in addition to some additional storage spaces that are um, added off of that uh, as a result of there's no school I've ever been aware of where they say we got plenty of storage. That typically doesn't happen. So it's just to accommodate uh, and allow for space for, for room to grow. Now back to why would you add a gym? So that existing white space to the left of the salmon color is the existing gym cafenatorium. And it is very clearly not a full-size gym. So that's uh, issue number one. Issue number two is also that's where uh, kids eat. That's where they do larger group gathering uh, to do you know, school-based things. And that's also where they do Fayette. Clearly, it's OK. It works the way it is. But the conversation around things we wanted to accomplish in addition to um, addressing some uh, educational space needs. This, of course, came to the top, uh, well, 
came to the list, I wouldn't necessarily argue to the top, but warranted some future conversation and the board saw fit to include this. One of the reasons it was included is because once again, that $34 million total uh, makes some sense with regard to what our capabilities are around mill rate and tax impact, and I'm gonna get into that in just a second. Um, so if that gym were added, that not only provides additional educational space for the kids and staff at Think Academy for Fayette and other things, other school-oriented get-togethers and so forth that you could use that gym space for. It also frees up now the cafeteria to be explicitly and almost solely a cafeteria, so you'd have much more flexible use of that space. Um, lastly, it would allow an opportunity for folks in the Rudolph Vesper area or anywhere within the district, of course, to have yet another gym for things like practices and wrestling, basketball, and so forth, so that it can be used as uh, our other elementary gyms are uh, for a variety of activities and for uh, use by the community. Getting to Washington, and we're nearing the, <coughs> excuse me, nearing the end of our buildings. You see here, if you're familiar with Washington, the entrance is as depicted there in blue. The office is actually kind of in and to the left a bit. That's, the, that's where the office entrance is currently. Uh, because of that, there's a little bit more uh, complex work that needs to be done. The addition is created similar to other buildings. The estimate there is just over a million dollars. So you would implement or add a new office space area, reception, principal's office, that sort of thing. That would then allow you the ability to create the secured entrance. And it's also the rationale behind why in addition versus a renovation in that building. Woodside, Woodside has, <clears throat> in order to accommodate the uh, secured entrance, um, a fairly easy uh, renovation sort of approach, similar to you've seen for other buildings because the office is directly to the right of that front entrance. So some modifications can be made there that are relatively simple. Although um, there has been some commentary around the office size at Woodside. And if we have some flexibility within uh, the, the dollars and cents of the referendum and, and uh, bids come in, if it's approved, uh, bids come in advantageously, that's a possibility for additional rework and some modifications to that office area at Woodside. Woodside is also one of our largest elementary schools and the office area uh, is a bit undersized for uh, what's all housed in there. So that might be something that we can um, address if, uh, if the bids come in in advantageous fashion. Um, lastly too, I don't wanna to forget to mention that uh, there are other capital and maintenance items um, that if there's dollars available from the $34 million bond issue, if it was approved, that we would uh, check some of those items off the list. A little a bit less glamorous, however, things like parking lots that need uh, repair, replacement, roofs, um, and so forth. So <clears throat> there would be some opportunities we're thinking to accomp accomplish some of those goals as well if uh, the referendum was passed. Okay, so tax impact being zero, I mentioned that at the front end. I'm mentioning it again now. If both of the questions are approved, the projections that we've engaged in indicate that there will not be an increase to the school portion of the tax levy. The school portion is the only portion we have control over. Everybody probably recognizes that your municipality has a portion, the tech school has a portion, and so forth, and the school district has a portion. How can that be, is the question. Well, uh, it indicated in this chart is our historic mill rate, and so you'll see anything up until 2021 is in fact reality. So in 2017, our mill was uh, for the school district was 10.82 and in 2021, it's 9.73. Um, the district had engaged in some uh, debt defeasance and buy down over the last few years um, through some excellent uh, and sound financial management as well as uh, the board being committed to saving taxpayer dollars. Uh, took advantage of those opportunities. So much like um, a mortgage or an auto loan, if you pay it down before it is due, you're saving dollars in terms of interest payments. So it does make a lot of sense if you have the capability to do that, to defease debt over time. That practice has positioned the district to be in a circumstance where um, the bond issue of $34 million, in addition to the $2 million levy override, are combined uh, and make up that portion that you see in white with the, with the diagonal lines through it. Maintaining, uh, in, as far as the projection is concerned, maintaining our 
basically current school-based tax levy rate. That is also, I'm going to tell you right now, a high estimate. Because if we run projections, we're going to run conservative projections and those that we think are fairly um, reasonable. And the number, even when, when run reasonable, is slightly less than 9.73. In fact, I believe it's 9.54. Um, so we're not talking about, you know, significant modifications, but in a general sense, I mentioned we've run catastrophic sort of uh, numbers. And in the catastrophic numbers, uh, we ran, well, let me go back. Our mill rate, local mill rate, is based off of um, a few different numbers. First off, it's based off of equalized property value. Equalized property value is provided to us by the state. Um, you might hear that my property value went down, but the equalized property value overall for the district went up. How is that possible? That's not based on simply individual properties. It's based on a state formula in which it's equalized and spread back out. It is relevant to our property, but is not necessarily one-to-one -one with your property value as it would be perceived by your bank or by, um, uh, you know, a... Uh, uh, a realtor as an example. So it's based on equalized property value as that's put into a, a pool, which is what uh, then provides the corresponding mill rate. So that's one factor. Pupil count is another factor. Pupil count though has a direct impact uh, on the mill rate, uh, both positively and negatively. If pupil count goes down, the mill rate goes down because we're able to levy per pupil although there's a smoothing effect because the state uses a three-year rolling average. So if you saw a precipitous drop, we have 5,100 students in general, and let's say it dropped to 4,800 from one year to the next. Because they use a three-year rolling average, it would clearly go down, but not all the way to 4,800 until uh, time progressed and that three-year rolling average kind of settles out. So it's a bit insulated from student increases or drops, but nonetheless, if we have more students, you're able to levy more. If you have fewer students, you're able to levy less. So that's not really a factor that you look too much into in terms of a mill rate impact because, again, it's proportionate to the number of kids that you have. We don't anticipate a, a, a spike or increase in students. We also don't anticipate a significant decrease. Over the last um, four or five years, we've settled out at right around 5,000 to 5,100 students district population, district-wide. And then, so we talked equalized property value, we talked pupil count. The other aspect of that is state aid. So state aid is taxes nonetheless, but state aid is not, uh, is comprised of local taxes, but it's also comprised of statewide taxes. So state aid is all put into the pot down in Madison. Madison runs it through their formula. Then the DPI tells us how much of that aid we uh, stand to get. Anything that we get in state aid, uh, the difference because of the revenue cap is made up based on the local levy. So the less state aid that we get, if the revenue cap stays the same, the more it's going to be made up in the local property tax levy. The more state aid we get, the less. So those things are proportionate. Um, we're typically aided at about 50%. It, it, it depends. So roughly 50% of our revenue is in terms of state aid and, and the other 50% in terms of local levy, as well as there's federal sources and other aspects that are not super relevant to this conversation. But in terms of the overall mill rate impact, that's kind of the magic scenario. So you have state aid, you have equalized property value, and you have pupil count. In running these projections, what we ran was a flat equalized property value to get us to this 9.73 or 9.5654. A flat property value, meaning property equalized property values stay at zero, not the total, but zero increase. Uh, flat number per pu of pupils, so we're gonna stay at roughly 5,100. And then virtually no change in state eight. And that gets us to uh, fall out at this, at this number here. If you increase property value, the mail rate goes down, equalized property value goes down. And so a conservative estimate is to increase property value by about 2%. After the last few years, equalized property values have been on the increase anywhere between three and say uh, five or 6%. Um, so that is a, a very conservative estimate. Um, state aid, we left flat, the budget is up in the air. 
Um, it's going to be an interesting uh, budget session this uh, go around. The next biennial budget is in development as we speak. Um, so that brings me to my main point. We ran a catastrophic scenario, and in a catastrophic scenario, we didn't do much with people count because once again, I said, if people count goes down, the levy goes down, it goes up, the levy goes up. We don't anticipate either of those happening. So we took that off the table, just left it where it was. And then we said, okay, what if property values go down? What if we lose 2% in property value? Which is possible, although it's been a while since something along those lines have happened. So we did a 2% decrease in equalized property value. And then I said, okay, what if we lose a million dollars in state aid? Which means we have less property value to spread amongst that levy and we have less state aid, but the revenue cap stays the same. What happens? Because then the taxpayers make up the difference. If both questions pass, we lose a million dollars in state aid and we lose 2% in property value. And I'm going to tell you once again, this is not a likely scenario. That's why you don't see it on the screen here. But if that were to happen, that drives the mill rate up to about 10 in that catastrophic scenario, which according to our historic projections is kind of within the realm of the last several years. Once again, I don't see that happening. And in fact, uh, what we're likely going to see is a mill rate that's uh, slightly under 9.73 if both of these pass for the reasons that I mentioned. We have, um, well, why would you take on additional debt? Because a comment that I would quickly make if I were in the audience was, so what you're telling me is that if we don't pass the referendum, our mill rate's going to be 8.14 rather than 9.73? And the answer to that question is uh, potentially for a year. And then after that, the impact of not having some debt to make payments on does come back to bite you to a degree. And the reason being is that under the state uh, funding formula, debt payments uh, are actually some debt payments, at least a reasonable amount, are decent for school districts to have because it's attributable to our per pupil spending. If our per pupil spending is boosted slightly, that also boosts our state aid, which as I indicated, is half for us, roughly half of what we have access to in the revenue cap. So although you would see a decline uh, in the first year if the questions were to fail, you would see over time a steady climb back up because our per pupil spending would not be at the level it has been because there isn't a debt payment resulting in a corresponding decrease in aid. That is not a one-to-one -one equation. So it's not as though if this happens, then this is exactly going to be the mill rate. That would be identified over time, depending upon the school funding formula, the budget, and how all of these things kind of shake out. But that, in a general sense, is how we could ask two questions uh, and have both questions approved and not see a tax impact on the school portion of the tax levy. This is uh, the last uh, public meeting regarding the referendum. We did two prior. Tonight's the, the last uh, one that we're running, but that doesn't mean that you can't ask questions or find out additional details. All of my contact information is here. 424-6701 is my telephone number. You see our website there. There is a, a referendum page on the district website, wrps.org. You see my email there. That's also on the website. And then of course we have um, various social media accounts. So with that, that concludes most of what uh, I intended to present, I think. I covered, I'm confident I covered all the topics that I wanted to. A sincere thank you for those that are watching at home and that are going to watch it later. And for those that have spent some time in the audience here, thank you uh, to you as well. And I will uh, entertain any questions. And if you don't have any questions because you don't want to ask them when we're on video, that's just fine. I'll hang around and answer them afterwards too. Are there any questions at this point, however? Yes, sir. Yeah, great. That's a great question. So the question was for the viewers at home, what's the baseline? So you're asking for $2 million a year for curriculum and technology. What's the baseline? And um, I, I guess to be as, as, as frank and clear as I possibly can be, um, th those are fun $10. So those are dollars we have access to uh, already. And so when it comes to 
making these decisions, and everybody says budgets are about decisions, right? And so would we still be able to make curricular purchases and some technology upgrades over time if we didn't have access to the levy override $2 million a year? The answer to that question is yes. Would we do that? Yes, we would. The reason being is because you don't really have the opportunity to just say, nah, we're not going to update computers because kids interact and interface with a computer now. There's really no other way to go about the educational process. Additionally, you're going to push off purchases of some things so things get to be in a little bit of, a, of, of disrepair. You're going to maybe uh, extend your curriculum purchasing timelines. You're going to maybe rework some things and you're going to spend fewer dollars, but hopefully not to the degree where it's uh, causing significant issues because it is about choices. So typically what happens, and I see Ed Allison, our buildings and grounds guy is here, but typically what happens when districts are in that position is that those fund $10 still go towards meeting kids' needs and making those purchases, but then you see we're not replacing that roof and we're not doing that parking lot and we're not taking care of this the way that we needed to because the overall budget, in a general sense, we could carve out portions of our budget and spend it solely and entirely on curriculum and have no need for these dollars. I'll tell you that right now because, again, it's fun 10. There's nothing that says in the state that you have to or you can't. It's about choices, right? But clearly over time, then you're forced into making choices and then there's other areas of the budget that are impacted by that. So that's correct. Virtually impossible to give you a baseline, but what we do know is what our overall expenditures uh, have been and what we want to do to maintain and continue, which is why I shared a lot of that technology curriculum update information, which accounts for like 7.6 million, right? So the commentary is around um, social movement and what you're referring to as woke curriculum in a, in, in, in a public school, you're saying. So every time that we adopt curriculum, um, there is a time, and in fact, there was just a time not too long ago, where there's an opportunity for the public to come in and evaluate the curriculum we're intending to purchase, and the materials are laid out, people can come in and take a look at that. So to answer your question, um, I would defer to the ability of the public to come and evaluate curriculum at any given time when we're going to purchase that. I'd also point out that um, a woke curriculum in terms of math, that'd be a stretch. Uh, that'd be a stretch for me because we're going to teach math. We're going to make sure that kids have fundamental math skills. And identifying um, aspects of curriculum, for example, that may be slanted and have uh, you know, one slant in one way or the other, to be honest with you. Uh, are things that we try to avoid. And the question would be, why would you avoid that? Well, the answer lies in the fact that we're a public school and we cater to 5,100 kids and their families. And not all of our kids come from the same background, the same uh, you know, ethnic makeup, the same uh, culture. But nonetheless, we have to meet the needs of 5,100 kids. And because we're a public school, we don't get to pick and choose. You can come, you can't. We like you, we don't like you. Everybody comes. That's one of the foundational reasons I'm standing here. That's why I even want to spend my time doing this is because of that very premise. With that said, being sensitive and intelligent about what we're engaging in and how we're engaging in it makes all kinds of sense, but it also provides some insight into um, you know, why you don't go one hard direction one way or the other, why we do evaluate and identify if curriculum is uh, you know, slanted in a, in a mechanism. It's also why we offer opportunities for individuals to review curriculum and answer that question for themselves. So in a general sense, do we adopt and implement curriculum that is purported to, uh, you know, enforce or, or to uh, bring people down to a certain viewpoint? The answer to that question is no. traditional history regarding the way the country was founded and so forth. So absolutely, and I think ironically, 
one of the pieces with regard to history is that those aspects don't change, correct? Because it's history. However, how you engage and how you discuss and where we go on those topics is absolutely relevant. And I think too, one of the things that I would mention, I'm 46 years old, soon to be 47, that's not super old, but I can tell you the way things were when I was in school are not the way that things are now. I don't have a problem with that. I don't know about many other things that are the same as it was when I was a kid as they are now. There's very few things. So one of the things we wanna do is we wanna be on the front edge. We wanna be uh, as up to date as possible. We wanna ensure that kids are ready for the challenges that face them in society in 2021 and beyond, uh, and not ensure that they're okay for 1980. Our parents, myself included, wouldn't wanna see that. So does that mean that things look different than they did back in the old days? Absolutely. Does that mean we've divorced ourselves from the, from the aspects of the foundational premise around why we're able to stand here and have conversations of this nature? Absolutely not. So I would say that if the push is to say we want it to be very similar to it was in 1980 or 70 or 60 or 90, I'm gonna tell you no, that's not gonna happen. And the reason being is because it's 2021. So there's going to be differences. How we interface and how we interact is gonna be different than it was um, several years ago, and I would argue it should be. That would be progress in moving down a continuum. Once again, are we arguing a certain slant, indo indoctrinating kids into some viewpoint over other viewpoints? The answer to that question is no. We educate kids so that they can make their own decisions regarding circumstance uh, and be engaged in contributing members of society. You're quite welcome. Other questions? And now my glasses are fogging up, so I can't see. Outstanding, well, thank you for your time. As I said, I'll hang around afterwards. Anybody wants to talk? Also, my contact information was up there. You can go to the website, and I appreciate your attention. Have a great night.